Hello everybody, thanks for coming to my talk. I am Daniel Farsinelli, a PhD candidate from the SUSPA Elmo Center for Information Security in Germany. And together with my colleagues Sion Park and Stefan Umberger, we did this research titled I Know Where You Parked Last Summer, Automated Reverse Engineering and Privacy Analysis of Modern Cars. Now, before everything, let me just briefly motivate our research. So if you take the current automotive ecosystem, we can see there are a lot of emerging technologies for which the industry is simply not ready. For example, we have telematic insurances, which ask users to put a black box inside their car. And this black box supposedly collects driving data, which are then sent to the insurance and are used to somehow calculate your premium. We have plug and play dongles, which again are third party companies that provide dongles to users that can be plugged to a car. And these dongles allow for some remote control, tuning, or generally remote diagnosis. We have telematic control units themselves, which are, have, are always connected to the internet and also have a really strong privileged access to the car because they are simply connected to the main CAN bus of the vehicle. Finally, we also have apps and functionalities that are just generally using the TCU or some other features of a car to provide remote functionalities to the user over a M. So the main problem is that all of this, we just don't know whether these apps or technologies are actually doing anything in the car. We don't know whether they are collecting data and if yes, which data, when, how, and where do they send it? So this motivated our research and we wanted to investigate how data are handled inside and outside a modern car. And we did this in a two part project in which in the first part, we wanted to understand if it's possible for a remote attacker like uh, let's say a provider of one of the ZBD dongle to extract private information from the logging that the dongle could send them. And it turns out that this is actually true. In fact, we developed a set of algorithms that are able to extract meaning from camp payload. And this actually meaning can be used both to attack the arm of privacy of the user and also to arm the security because you can use what you discover to actually mount more um, attacks. We tested our arguments also on four different vehicles. Three of them were electric and one diesel, and they were perfectly in all of them. In the second part, instead, we analyzed the telematic control unit itself. Uh, we took one from a Renault Zoe 2015, and we wanted to see, since now we knew uh, we had our argument to reverse engineering the CAM payload, we wanted to see whether the TCU was actually interacting with these payloads and somehow sending some data to the OM. And to do that, we reverse engineering its scan, GSM communication, and we also its firmware. And we actually found out that the tissue is indeed arming with user privacy because it's uploading stuff to the maker, but it's also not really good for security because it had a lot of vulnerabilities. So to the first part of our talk, the automated reverse engineering of CAN traffic. Now we need reverse engineering because although CAN is a public standard, uh, the payload the various ACUs transmit are intellectual property, which means if you log a current frame and you try to analyze it, you will just see bits. You just have no idea on how to interpret the fields. So the point of our algorithm was to first apply a step of segmentation in order to determine the boundaries and types of a value field within the frame, then to apply a correlation step in order to determine how these fields are correlated between each other. And this really helps also for the labeling. And we wanted to do this without having any sort of previous knowledge about the vehicle. So we're assuming an attacker which simply doesn't know anything. We also didn't want to use any OBD access because OBD is visible, first of all, and also is very unreliable, especially for electric vehicles as it's not required. And finally, we also didn't want to have any active communication at all. So no replay attack or anything to see how ACUs react, again, because it's very visible and actually quite dangerous. So now to our algorithm, as a first step, we have to collect data. So we developed a logger and asked participants to plug into their car. And this device logged uh, various weeks of traffic from four different cars. Uh, three of them were electric and one was a fuel. And out of those data, we also manually reverse engineered more than 250 signals, but we used them as a ground truth to somehow uh, obviously evaluate our algorithm. And, but then how does our algorithm work? Now, if you take a look at a single log, what you would see is, well, obviously in the time axis is simply frames and each frame has an ID and a payload. So because of how can work, each frame ID 
correspond a specific payload encoding, and that payload encoding is fixed simply because this frame ID is fixed over the lifetime of the vehicle. So we can apply our segmentation step to each uh, frame ID individually. So in this case, we just take as an example the uh, 0C frame and we just extract the payload since the ID is not necessary anymore. Now, given a frame series, as we call it, uh, this frame series can also be visualized as a matrix in which we have a byte, bit, and time in the three axes. And if then we start uh, trying to uh, create boundaries and plot the values over time, what we will see is that there are four type of values possible in CAN, at least in the 99% of the cases. And we have in the plot A like speed, continuous value, B is a checksum, so random values, C is enumeration, where it's like flags, and in D is again unsigned integers, but uh, it's a cyclic value, so they don't really uh, relate to any sense or information. So the aim of our segmentation is to develop a set of metrics able to identify these four different type of values and their boundaries. So what we developed is an iterative algorithm which examines uh, bit by bit the payload and computes a metric we call the Hamming distribution. Now this metric measures how much each bit changes in relation to the change in value of a complete frame which means an Hamming distribution of zero means a bit is constant, while uh, an Hamming distribution of one means a bit changes every time the frame changes. So if we start iterating through the bits, we can see that the first bit is constant as labeled as such. And when we go further, the algorithm proceeds until there is a sharp change of Hamming distribution between two consecutive bits. And when it happens, it creates the boundaries. After that, we have an additional set of metrics uh, out of which a one that is displayed is the uh, signal autocorrelation, which we use to identify the signal type. So after we compute, after we create the boundaries, we, we compute these additional uh, metrics, and then we use them to level the signal. Then the uh, algorithm goes on and, and keeps uh, examining bit by bit until it finds uh, new fields. And in this case, you can see we have a flag. Then it goes on and we find cyclics, which are very easy to identify from the autocorrelation because as you can see, it, is, uh, it has uh, peaks always at the same distance and also the Hamming distribution is perfectly geometric. And finally, we can find also checksum by simply both the Hamming distribution is generally towards uh, the 0 0.5 and also the autocorrelation is obviously uh, zero in average. And the iterative algorithm is then applied to every single frame ID in an independent way. And what we end up with is this matrix, which displays on the rows the CAN ID and on the columns, the bit, which means the colors are the way the bit has been classified. So if we compare our results with a ground truth matrix displayed on the right, as you can see, they match almost perfectly a part of few issues. Now, the good thing is that all the misclassified bits are either cyclic numbers, but don't repeat often enough. For example, the signal transporting the hour of a day or most even bits of integers, which simply don't change often enough to be correctly classified. So all of this means that the algorithm would classify this field correctly if the logs were longer or in more diverse driving situation, which also means that if we have an OBD logger perpetually uploading the frames, then slowly we can assume the algorithm would converge to the... So now that we have the frame segmentation, we can extract the signals and interpret them. What we obtain is a table in which each column represents a current kind of signal. For example, the first is a 16-bit unsigned integer extracted from the frame ID 06. So the next phase is the correlation, and our aim is to identify correlation between the signals, like the one uh, shown below. This is extremely useful in order to be able to label those signals. Also, in CAN, it's common to have a similar value, like the speed displayed here, broadcasted by various ACUs with a slightly different time and scale. It defines such correlation is also very relevant, uh, mostly because it's heavily simplify the labeling. So to account for this, we first normalize the columns and then apply a windowing with a 100 millisecond window in order to reduce both the complexity and also align the frames containing similar signal broadcasted at slightly different times. So now that we have a normalized table, we perform a two-step correlation approach. First, we join signals via an AST composed of basic mathematical operations like integration and multiplication. These newly created signals are then cross-correlated between each other to find relations. For example, it is easy to find the dominator signal by correlating it with a signal derived by the integral of speed. 
Following, we also create a correlation graph using the Pearson correlation. This graph uses a 95% similarity factor to display in a visual way how much the signals linearly correlate to each other. This allows us to cluster very signal together very easily and to, to simplify the labeling heavily. Then, both AST and graph are displayed to the user, which goes through them and label the signals accordingly. Obviously, we still have a human involved. However, our approach heavily simplifies the process, as just by labeling few easy to label values, like the speed, the whole process becomes much easier. Nevertheless, this is where our future work will focus to. Ideally, by using machine learning and mathematical modeling, we can substitute the human part to have the process completely automated. So here comes the end of our can reversing. Uh, our outcome demonstrates that it is possible to infer meaning from CAN payloads remotely and passively. So this heavily impact previous research, as until now researchers worked in the assumption that physical access was required to reverse CAN. And this also means that most third-party dongles could simply log the CAN traffic and infer very private information about the user. Also, we test our algorithms on four different vehicles, and the segmentation had an average of 80% signals perfectly matched with the ground truth. And for the rest, we had generally just one to two misclassified bits. Finally, our segmentation outperforms statistic algorithms, like read algorithm for boundary detection. And to our knowledge, we are the first doing some additional correlation on top of segmentation, especially without having OBD access or any sort of other active data manipulation. So now about the part two of our talks, which is the analysis of a telematic control unit. So since now we had a quite strong knowledge about which data were transmitted to the CAN uh, and which were visible to the TCU since we know its placement, we decided we wanted to analyze if and what the TCU was logging and if any of it was being sent to the OM. So in order to do that, we took a TCU from the Renault Zoe 2015, which was one of our current tests, and completely reversed it by analyzing the scan, GSM, and WART communication, as well as with firmware. Then, by analyzing the scan communication, we discovered that this is mostly passive and simply broadcast a frame to inform the other issues about its presence. Also, we noticed that burst of activity upon certain events, like every 50 minutes on upon engine start, stop, charging start and stop, or whenever we were sending a command via the mobile app. These events trigger the TCU to initiate an OBD session with a battery management system uh, and fetching data regarding the current state of the battery. So after checking this scan communication, we dismounted the TCU from the car and mounted it in our lab and analyzed its UART communication. Uh, the UART port is normally connected to the multimedia panel. So what we discovered is that the TCU supports standard AT commands as well as Renault specific ones but these Renault commands, we just discovered it after inspecting the firmware, so we didn't use them now. And also the TCU prints a lot of debug text to this UART, which is generally to inform a multimedia panel, uh, we guess maybe for logging, about this state. So after that, we mounted a complete GSM man in the middle attack by faking a base station using our own base station and forcing the TCU to connect to us. Uh, by doing that, we were able to route all the HTTP uh, web traffic going through the TCU via our base station. So what we discover is that the TCU has three traffic flows. Two were generated by the multimedia panel towards Atos, an IT service provider, and TomTom, while the last one was generated by the TCU itself and, were, and was targeting a Renault server. Now, this last flow caught our interest because it matched perfectly with the connectivity of the TCU, which likely meant that the TCU was fetching some data before sending it to the server. So the problem is that this flow was also protected by SL2 certificate, so we couldn't really sniff on it. However, we also understood that it was always initialized by the TCU, which also meant that all the remote commands you actually issue via your phone are not delivered via HTTP, but via SMS. So since we couldn't do much more, we decided to disassemble the TCU. By uncovering it, we discovered that the main chip is an ARM-based air prime made by Serla Wireless. Now, this board also comes with OpenIT, an operating system for M2M applications developed and distributed again by Serla Wireless. The good thing is that it also ships with an IDE as a plugin for Eclipse, and this allowed us to reverse engineer it to understand how it talked to the board. Obviously, we found a vulnerability, and we were able to dump the whole firmware and RAM at runtime. So I don't plan to go through the firmware disassembly part for lack of time, and uh, I will just go directly to our discoveries. So 
what we discovered was quite alarming. First of all, the TCU supports a huge set of hidden services, which allows it to both track and control the car. Worse, all of this can be stealthy enabled, disabled, or configured by Renault without the user noticing. Also, by default, the TCU is tracking the car every 50 minutes or whenever the engine is turned on, off, or the battery is charged or not. However, we also found out that TCU can, one, sniff on arbitrary frames via the probe services, two, remotely control the door, engine, arm, and light of the car. Also, the TCU can remotely disable the battery, this, which this was a threat from Renault if you stop paying the battery lease. At least it's nice to know that it was not fake. And also, the TCU can trigger transmission whenever you go outside a certain GPS position, above a certain speed, or are driving at a certain time. Also, all trigger transmissions uniquely identify the car, its current state, and GPS position. What's worse is that the TCU is based on outdated libraries like OpenSSL from 2003 and the multimedia panel itself, which was weirdly based on Android 2, had full access to it via IT commands which means that TCU is kind of a perfect entry point for any sort of attacker. So this concludes the TCU analysis. Now, the whole point of our research was to raise awareness that right now cars don't have any concept of security or access control, which also means that anything that has access to a bus can virtually see every data going through it. We think authorities should start treating cars as they are treating smartphones or websites and enforce higher security and privacy standards. As of now, every single doggle you plug in your car or the tissue itself might as well as be tracking you constantly while being also an entry point for an attacker. So this concludes my talk. I hope you enjoyed it despite the weird circumstances and the small amount of time to go through the details. And feel free to ask questions. Have a nice day.